I will be putting chapter markers in the description box directly underneath this video. If you're watching on a tablet, you might need to open it by clicking on a little triangle in one of the bottom corners to aid with your navigation through this video, uh, which might be quite a long one. So if you want to jump to various parts of it, those markers should be in the description box. Equally, you can just watch from the beginning as usual if you want to. My previous video was based on the judgment in the 2021 Tommy Robinson vs. Jamal Hijazi libel trial. Now, I understood that judgment to be subject to a gagging order. I believe there is a gagging order, but I think that only relates to Tommy releasing those videos of his. I don't think it... well, it doesn't relate to the judgment. However, I did believe that at the time, and I didn't want to risk putting the judgment on screen. So I basically read it, and then I improvised for about 20 minutes, entirely from memory, without notes of any kind, and did a pretty damn good job, I thought. However, that is why my delivery was a little bit more halting than usual, uh, with a few too many errs thrown in for good measure, because I was flying by the seat of my pants. I had the structure in my head, but I was otherwise working entirely from memory. That's why it was a little bit more halting than my usual video would be. It was not because the Kazi of Calibar was hanging over me with a scimitar between his teeth and a fatwa in his hand. Some of you, not all of you, I know, not the vast majority, but some of you need to get away from your computer screens, unplug from this absurd insanity matrix, take the actual red pill, and just breathe some fresh air. Some of the comments that people made were absolutely ludicrous, that I'd somehow been threatened to changing things. This is absolutely ludicrous. I understand how the persecution complex develops when you, when you exist almost entirely in these hard right-wing conspiracy echo chambers, but it is ludicrous and you are hurting nobody but yourselves with these ridiculous ideas. It was simply because I was working entirely from memory, and not because there was a gang of marauding Muslim banging on my door insisting on a retraction. Just to clarify that. However, the judgment in the 2021 libel case, Jamal Hijazi versus the Lenin Lad, overseen by Mr. Justice Nick Lynn, what a good name for a judge, is freely available online. The link is in the description and it can be freely discussed. I checked with the relevant division, the King's Bench, as it is now, not the Queen's Bench anymore, and I am good to go. There are no risks to discussing this. And I will show those of you who care to know, and I do know that there are some who don't, whose support for Tommy Robinson is exclusively tribal and not fact-based. I will show those who do care to know that he did not succeed in his libel defence. And uh, as a way of being as brief as possible, which will not be very brief, I fear, I will only be looking at those three incidents which Tommy used to specifically defend his truth position as he saw it. Again I say I know the vast majority of you are sane and appreciate a fact-based reality check and I say I know that not through some braggadocious display of confidence which actually isn't there. I do literally know it because I can see the like ratio in the studio and for that last video which wasn't my best by any means the like ratio was very high in the circumstances 87% to 13% so I know the majority of you are sane and appreciate uh, a, a sensible analysis of these things. Can I just say that it will be very helpful for those of you who do like this kind of thing if you could stick a little like on the video, it does very much help with the algorithm. Jamal's lawyers based their libel claim on statements which Tommy made in two videos. The judge defined the meanings of those statements thuswise. I will be referring to Jamal and Tommy rather than the claimant and the defendant. In the first of the two videos, Jamal had, as part of a gang, participated in a violent assault on a young girl which had caused her significant injuries and threatened to stab another child. In the second, Jamal had, as part of a gang, participated in a violent assault on a young girl which had caused her serious injuries. So those are the legally defined meanings of the libelous comments. 
He goes on to say, The hockey stick incident and the group attack incident are relied upon by Tommy to establish the substantial truth of Imputation 1. Tommy relies upon the alleged threat to stab Bailey McLaren to prove the substantial truth of Imputation 2. Then, regarding the other incidents which Tommy wanted to bring in, like the board pin incident, for example, he said, Tommy was allowed to rely upon these further incidents because if he were able to prove them, then although they would not themselves prove the substantial truth of Imputations 1 and 2, he might be successful in demonstrating that Jamal had a propensity towards bullying and violent behaviour. On the question of the libel charge, Tommy sought to downplay the outreach of the videos. However, nevertheless, Tommy has admitted that, because of the seriousness of the Imputations 1 and 2, and the extent of publication, the requirements of Section 1 Defamation Act 2013, Serious Harm to Reputation, are met. In other words, Tommy accepts the charge. And this is the list of the various incidents Tommy brought in for his truth defence. These are the additional ones, and those are the ones specific to the libel charge. The specifically libelous comments were the biting allegation and the allegation that Jamal threatened to stab Bailey. The first one you see there, the hockey incident, is not either of the libelous statements, but the judge allowed him to include it, which is what Tommy wanted to do. The hockey stick incident is not the allegation that the defendant made against Jamal in the first and second videos. Never Nevertheless, the law of defamation permits the defendant to demonstrate the substantial truth of an allegation by proving incidents that show the same or similar behaviour by a claimant. And so we will be looking at these three incidents. I will be highlighting here almost exclusively only the judge's conclusions because they contain all the relevant information. So, the hockey incident, said to have taken place sometime between January and February 2017, is the first of the two alleged attacks on young girls. And I will be jumping in along the way to comment. The judge says, For the reasons I would explain, I reject the evidence of Charlie Matthews and OTP. OTP was brought in as a witness. I accept the evidence of Jamal. Charlie Matthews' evidence is simply incredible, by which he means non-believable rather than extraordinary. On her account, in the middle of a school PE lesson, she had been the victim of a serious, unprovoked assault in which a hockey stick had been used effectively as a weapon. The incident, as described by Charlie, was a serious criminal assault that could easily have led to Jamal's prosecution. As a result of the insult, she claimed that she had lived in fear of Jamal, that the incident had been a significant contributor to her anxiety and ultimately to her being unable to continue at the school, and four years later she was still in pain, for which she was taking prescription medication. This is a good example of a series of events which, if true, would have generated a host of either supportive or corroborative documents. In other words, you'd expect a bunch of reports to materialise following an incident as serious as this. I will point out something here which might be relevant. Some people might get confused and say, ah yes, but remember those NDAs which staff and governor and everyone was required to sign, apparently by Kirkley's council. Yes, that may well be the case, but all of that post-dates these incidents we're talking about here. This predates those NDA uh, agreements by a good couple of years. First, according to Charlie, she reported the incident to the teacher in charge of the PE lesson. It was an incident alleged to have been witnessed by OTP, although he claimed by none of the other pupils in the class. It is clear from Charlie's own school records that on 15th of April 2016, when she had suffered a nosebleed as a result of being struck by a cricket ball in a PE lesson, an accident report was completed by the school, which was sent home to her parents. An entry was also made in a diary kept by the school recording the incident. This records that Charlie's mother had been informed of the incident, and she had said that Charlie could come home. The point is that there was a similar incident just a few months previous for comparison which did generate the kind of reports you would expect to generate following a reasonably serious incident. And the hockey incident was clearly much more serious again, assuming it happened. This is the sort of documentation that is routinely kept by schools in relation to incidents of significance. The reasons why such records are kept are obvious and need no elaboration. If Charlie Matthews and OTP's allegations about the hockey stick incident are true, then putting matters at their lowest, the pupil at the school had suffered injury as a result of being hit with a hockey stick during a PE lesson. The incident had been reported to the teacher in charge of the lesson, but if true, he did nothing about it. Not only did he take no immediate action against Jamal, but no investigation was initiated subsequently to find out whether there were grounds upon which to discipline Jamal. Further, no record was made, even of the injury or the circumstances in which it had been caused. Why would the teacher act in such gross dereliction of duty? No remotely credible explanation has been provided by Tommy or Charlie. The reason I am satisfied is that no such incident was reported by Charlie or the witness to any member of staff. That is because no such incident happened. So, point one is, there are no records. Second, as a matter of chronology, it is clear from Charlie's school records that her anxiety issues predated the hockey stick incident. In her statement, she said she had anxiety issues and she seemed to suggest that they were caused by this incident. 
Of perhaps evidential significance, the school's efforts to address these anxiety issues led to various meetings between Charlie and those who were attempting to provide support to her. Contemporaneous records of some of these meetings were available at the trial. For example, in a form that had been completed in order to refer Charlie for specialist learning support dated 12th of October 2017, the school recorded that Charlie had not attended the school since 6th of September 2017 as a result of severe anxiety. The report was based on information provided by Charlie. There is no mention of the hockey stick incident, which, had it happened, Charlie could have been expected to mention this as a major contributor to her anxiety as she claimed in her evidence. A child with documented anxiety issues who suffers such a vicious attack would be expected to mention it at some point as contributing to her anxiety issues, but she didn't. Then we get some more anxiety related stuff. There is also a letter from an emotional health worker who had been providing one-to-one -one support to Charlie between November 2017 and February 2018. This indicated that the author had spent considerable time observing Charlie's behaviour and discussing her feelings in detail. Again, if, as she claimed, the hockey stick incident was a major contributor to her anxiety at school, Charlie would have had no reason not to disclose this to her emotional health worker. The referral form also noted that she had received mentoring from her head of house and additional support from the school nurse for the last two years. That contact would have provided further opportunities opportunities for Charlie to disclose the hockey stick incident in the context of discussions with those who were trying to address her anxiety issues. Had Charlie disclosed the hockey stick incident to any of these people, then it is likely action would have been taken that would have led to some sort of investigation by or with the school. These actions would have generated documents recording Charlie's disclosure and the actions taken in response. I have Charlie's school records. Beyond those identified in 100 above, there are no such documents. All this anxiety stuff presumes that the incident caused anxiety, which you'd think it would. This is what she said. I continued at the school until around May 2017, however during this time I began to become increasingly anxious and scared to go to school. Jamal was a significant contributory factor in my decision to leave the school and transfer to another school. It's not 100% clear from her words that the incident caused anxiety specifically, and if it didn't then this is largely irrelevant. You would expect that such a vicious attack would be mentioned somewhere in these lengthy anxiety discussions, and as it is being voluminously pointed out, there is no mention of it whatsoever. Third, I can test the veracity of Charlie's claims by reference to her mother's reaction. According to Charlie, she told her mother about what had happened. Most parents, if told by their child that she had been assaulted with a hockey stick at school, and as a result she was in serious pain, could be expected to react in several ways. First, I would expect a complaint to have been made to the school, and thereafter followed possibly with a complaint to the police. Second, I would expect the parent to ensure that the child sought medical assessment or treatment. Both would generate documentary records. According to Charlie, she had undergone both x-rays and MRI scans, there are no records. More bizarrely, on 4th of April 2019, when Charlie's mother did finally disclose the alleged hockey stick incident, if the records are accurate, she appeared to want it to be treated as confidential. Charlie Matthews' mother has not given evidence in these proceedings, so I should be cautious in my findings, but in the absence of some credible explanation, these actions do not appear to be consistent with a parent who genuinely believes that, whilst at school, her daughter had been seriously assaulted by another school with a hockey stick. It is inconceivable that there would be no medical records if she'd had the treatments she described. And we carry on in that damning vein. Fourth, Charlie claimed, even now, four years later, to be in significant pain as a result of the incident and still to be taking prescription painkillers. Yet, no medical... Medical records have been produced to confirm this. On the contrary, the only information I have from Charlie's GP is a letter from 18th of January 2018 stating that she has no medical problems. In her evidence, Charlie stated this is the same GP who she claimed had been prescribing her pain relief medication. If Charlie is currently taking prescription painkillers over four years since the hockey stick incident, then something else has caused the need for such pain relief. The hockey stick incident, as described by Charlie, did not happen. Prescription painkillers by definition require a prescription, and there was no prescription. Now we get to this OTP witness. What of OTP's evidence purporting to confirm the hockey stick incident? It appeared to me that, during his cross-examination, OTP was tailoring his evidence in an effort to support the evidence of Charlie, who he had heard being cross-examined. He was astute enough to appreciate that the lack of any other witnesses in a class of more than 20 pupils might cast doubt on the credibility of the account, so ridiculously he claimed that every other child had been looking the other way when the assault happened. However, OTP was not adept enough to be able to navigate his account around his claim that Charlie had been sent to seek medical assistance 
assistance by the teacher when she had made no such claim, and whether the teacher had even been in the room when the incident happened. I have already rejected OTP's evidence in relation to the incident involving BWI. I am also satisfied that OTP's evidence about the hockey stick incident was dishonest fabrication that fell apart when he was cross-examined on the details. So this apparent witness said that Charlie had been sent to first aid, which she said was not the case. And even if 25 odd children are running in one particular direction, in the opposite direction, somebody is going to see something, somebody is going to turn around, somebody is going to see something, at least in their peripheral vision, and the scream is clearly going to attract attention, but apparently nobody saw or heard anything. Then this paragraph, which I won't read, is about that witness's evidence being influenced by others, and that one is the judge saying he can't work out why Charlie would make things up, but she did. People can lie for various reasons that make no sense, sometimes for no reason at all. I am quite satisfied that the evidence of both Charlie Matthews and OTP about the hockey stick incident is false. For the reasons I have given, Tommy has failed to prove that the hockey stick incident happened. On the evidence, I am satisfied it did not happen, whether as alleged by Charlie Matthews or at all. This is what we would have to believe. Jamal commits grievous bodily harm on Charlie. None of the class see or hear anything. Charlie does not go to first aid. The teacher does not write a report of the incident. Charlie does not mention this incident in any of her anxiety counselling. Possible, but unlikely. There are no medical records of anything, although Charlie claims to have received medical treatment and medically prescribed drugs. Charlie's mother does not raise the matter with anyone. The judge says that on the basis of the evidence, this didn't happen. A small number of you do need to ask yourselves the following question. Is this because Abdul Abulbul was hanging over the judge with a scimitar between his teeth and a fatwa in his hand, or because it didn't happen? That same small number of you also need to ask yourselves this question. I endorse the judge's findings. Is this because I have Abdul Abulbul hanging over me with a scimitar between his teeth and a fatwa in his hand, there is a herd of marauding Muslim at my door threatening to do something extraordinary if I don't post some kind of a bizarre retraction or because it didn't happen. Which one do you think? So going on, the biting incident was one of the statements which Tommy made which led directly to the libel claim. It starts at paragraph 118, but that's all stuff we already know about, what was said in the videos and a bit of text message stuff, so I'll start at 125. I won't be jumping in here, but this is all really quite short and there's nothing worth jumping in for. Jamal's evidence at trial was that the group attack incident did not happen as alleged or at all. He said that he didn't know who the girl was. Tommy cross-examined Jamal. He put to Jamal the direct messages that the girl's mother had sent Tommy. Jamal maintained his denial. As Tommy did not have any details of the alleged event, he could not take the cross-examination any further. Tommy has failed to prove the group attack incident. The case depends entirely upon hearsay. There is no direct evidence from the girl herself even by hearsay. Despite her apparent reluctance even to speak to him, Tommy could have secured the attendance of the girl at the trial by use of a witness summons. The evidence relied upon by Tommy amounts to second-hand hearsay from the girl's mother in respect of allegations that she has publicly disavowed. I cannot attach any weight to this evidence. The hearsay is untested by cross-examination. The recordings of the girl's mother have been edited and I only have a partial transcript. There are clearly other occasions on which the girl's mother has given details of the allegations about the attack on the girl to Tommy, but I do not have a record of what she said. The two recordings were obtained covertly. There is no indication when the alleged assault of the girl took place, but the hearsay accounts of it are not contemporaneous. One of the girl's mother's answers in the second interview is ambiguous. Tommy asked two questions rolled into one. Was he there? Was he involved? When she answers yeah, it is not clear whether she is answering the question was he there or was he involved? Previously the girl's mother had confirmed only that Jamal was there. No details are provided in either recording about what Jamal is alleged to have done or that the girl has suffered serious or significant injuries in consequence. Against that, Jamal has given sworn evidence at the trial and been cross-examined. I have no basis on which to reject his evidence. Indeed, I find Jamal to have been a credible and truthful witness throughout his evidence. As a result of my conclusions in relation to the hockey stick incident and the group attack incident, Tommy has failed to prove the substantial truth of imputation one. So we have this. Jamal bites girl after an attack by three other girls. There are no witnesses to the incident. The mother commented on Facebook and posted photos of her daughters with injuries apparently caused by the attack and the biting. There don't seem to be any records with the medical services, school or police. The mother says the school did nothing, which suggests she told them, but no record has been produced. 
this is all unsatisfactory for everyone. All you have is photos of a clear injury, there is no disputing that, and a second-hand claim on the part of the mother. All there is is a claim there are no records of anything, police, school, medical, nothing. He says that Tommy has failed to prove the group attack incident. That is just reality. No judge is going to say, on the basis of the evidence we have here, I accept that it happened, because the evidence just isn't there. So we go on to the apparent threat to stab Bailey. Tommy originally put it this way. Jamal had been in a lesson with Bailey McLaren. He dragged Bailey's coat across the floor of the classroom. When Bailey told him to stop, he replied with words to the effect, wait until lunchtime, you are going to get stabbed. On the same day, whilst he was eating lunch, one of Jamal's friends approached Bailey and told him that Jamal was going to stab him. The incident shown in the viral video occurred as a direct result of Bailey's confronting Jamal about Jamal's threat to stab him, hence Bailey's opening words, what are you saying now? The first bit of the statement Tommy later amended by removing all that thuswise and in inserting the underlined stuff, so it now reads, Jamal had been in a lesson with Bailey McLaren, there was a disagreement between the two boys in which Jamal's coat was on the floor and insults were exchanged. Bailey McLaren grabbed a Jamal, then left the classroom. So Tommy subsequently removed the suggestion that Jamal had dragged Bailey's coat on the floor and threatened to stab him directly, and replaced it with that more ambiguous aversion with no stabbing, leaving the stabbing described in the second paragraph. One of Jamal's friends approached Bailey and told him that Jamal was going to stab him. And that was always Bailey's claim. He never said he heard the stab threat directly. So that leaves the friend. In response to a request for further information dated 9th of August 2019, Tommy stated that the identity of Jamal's friend referred to in paragraph 7.1 was a present unknown. Witness statements were subsequently exchanged, but Bailey McLaren's statement did not identify the unknown friend. Then we do get a name. Subsequently he was approached by the person he had described as an Asian lad who he named as Ahmed. Miss Evans QC asked Bailey how he had been able to recall the name of Ahmed in the witness box. His answers were unconvincing. He said that he had pieced it together after he had written his witness statement. It might be odd that Bailey can't identify this person, particularly given the nuclear fallout of the whole thing would have focused his mind on it an awful lot. And then that he can identify him as Ahmed, but still he can't be traced, might seem even more strange, because at this point he does know who he is, apparently. And identifying him on the basis that he pieced it together is quite a big bit implausible. Of course, if he had actually said what was claimed and been traced and brought to court, he would obviously have denied it and said Bailey was lying because he was hardly going to catch Bailey a break, so that wouldn't have helped in the slightest. Nonetheless, the problem remains. We have a name and no more recalled by means of a bizarre mental process. So all this what are you saying now in the video clearly seems to be the result of provocation of some kind, and this does give credence to a claim about stabbing, because that would be provocation. However, Jamal did provoke Bailey. This is from the incident report of the classroom incident which happened just before. Something happened between Bailey and Jamal. It resulted in Bailey shouting at Jamal angrily about him, swearing at him. At one point Bailey had his hand at Jamal's throat. I got in between them and sent Bailey outside to calm down. After this Bailey said, I'll kill him and I'll headbutt him. Jamal swore at this point, F off. Bailey said, I'll stab you with a knife, whispered. Those last two sentences were added by somebody else. The judge doesn't concern himself with that, but I think it's unhelpful. So this was Bailey's account of the classroom incident, which happened beforehand, and him saying he stepped on Jamal's coat. I then said sorry to him, which he took the wrong way and told me to F off. I asked him to repeat it. He said F off, you white bastard, so I then reacted to him and grabbed him by the throat, which I am not pleased about myself, but I wasn't having somebody call me that. Then we have two reports from pupils. Jamal was bumped into accidentally outside science by Bailey. Jamal told Bailey to F off. What happened in the field was Bailey teaching Jamal that he isn't someone you can just tell to F off. Bailey accidentally stood on Jamal's back. Jamal told Bailey to F off and pushed him. Then whatever happened on the field happened. Jamal started it. So I think we have the provocation which resulted in all the what are you saying now, which was Jamal telling Bailey to F off. The problem with that is it's not what Tommy originally claimed. It's also quite a bit milder than a threat to stab somebody, always bearing in mind that this is all just schoolyard shenanigans that got totally blown out of any proportion by a media desperate to find racism in every corner. But crucially, Tommy's statement does seem to be false because there was no threat to stab. So the judge's summary on all that. 
Overall, Bailey's evidence about this supposed threat by Jamal to stab him is not credible. In the original defence, Tommy claimed that the threat was made by Jamal clearly and directly to Bailey as part of the incident in the science class. That was not correct. It had never been Bailey's evidence, and there is no support for it in the incident report completed by the teacher contemporaneously with the events. Bailey's account in his original incident report was that it was only later that he got told that Jamal had said he was going to stab him when he saw him. You can't blame Bailey for that. That was simply Tommy getting it wrong. So I think this is his worshipfulness giving all this a little bit too much weight. In his witness statement, Bailey adopted the same evidence, albeit with an attempt to weave in a suggestion of something said by Jamal in his own language, a striking phrase that also appeared in Charlie Matthews' statement that might have been a threat to stab him. That last part of Bailey's evidence has simply been manufactured as an effort to connect the alleged threat more directly to Jamal. It was denied by Jamal when he was cross-examined, and I reject it. That leaves Tommy with the hearsay evidence of the belatedly identified Ahmed as the only evidence capable of demonstrating that Jamal had made a threat to stab Bailey. As a piece of hearsay, I can attach little or no weight to it. Ahmed has not been called to give evidence. The court does not even have his full name. His evidence has not been tested. As Bailey accepted when he was giving evidence, even if his evidence of what Ahmed is alleged to have said to him is accepted, he does not know whether Ahmed was telling the truth about this supposed threat by Jamal. I have no idea who he is and whether he would have any motive to lie. On balance, I can consider that the claim to have been told that Jamal had threatened to stab him by Ahmed or anyone else was manufactured by Bailey. He first gave this lie in the account he gave in the incident report as an effort to try and excuse his attack on Jamal. If Bailey needed a reason to attack Jamal in the playing field incident beyond providing another opportunity to bully him, it was because Jamal had told him to F off in the incident over the coat in the science lesson, as the other incident reports tended to confirm. By the stage of giving his account in the incident report, Bailey was already aware that the school had the viral videos as evidence of the playing field incident. He could not deny it. So he set about trying to explain and mitigate it. I conclude that he has given evidence in this trial and persisted in the lie about Jamal threatening to stab him, at least partly because he feels indebted to Tommy for the help he has given him and because he wants to try and assist him in return. Unlike Charlie Matthews and OTP, I can identify a reason why Bailey has been willing to lie in the evidence he has given. For these reasons, Tommy has failed to prove the substantial truth of Invitation 2. In consequence, Tommy's truth defence must be rejected and judgment on the claim will be granted to Jamal. So, summary time. Jamal is alleged to have threatened to stab Bailey. Tommy, the defendant, initially states that the threat is made to Bailey directly in class, but later amends this to having been heard second-hand in the dining hall from an Asian friend of Jamal, which is in line with Bailey's testimony. The Asian friend is never identified beyond the name Ahmed, and Bailey claims that he had pieced together his recollection of this after making his statement, which is implausible. The court considers that Bailey manufactured his testimony in gratitude to Tommy, who had been very supportive to him. Bailey's repetition in the video of the phrase, what are you saying now, suggests provocation on Jamal's part, but the only evidence that the provocation was a stab threat is the second-hand report of Ahmed, and we do know that Jamal provoked Bailey by swearing at him. This one comes down to, this bloke told me that another bloke told him that he was going to stab me, and I have no idea whether he was lying or not. Tommy cannot expect his evidence to be accepted on this basis. Even if the judge was favourable towards him, which he clearly was not, he would have to reject it. So, the full summary of all of this, and if you've been watching from the beginning, this is basically uh, my summaries put together on one document. Hockey stick incident. Jamal hits Charlie with a hockey stick. None of the class see or hear anything. Charlie does not go to first aid. The teacher does not write a report of the incident. Charlie does not mention this incident in any of her anxiety counselling. There are no medical records of anything, although Charlie claims to have received medical treatment and medically prescribed drugs. Charlie's mother does not raise the matter with anyone. Biting incident. Jamal bites girl after an attack by three other girls. There were no witnesses to the incident, but the mother commented on Facebook and posted photos of her daughter with injuries apparently caused by the attack and the bite. There don't seem to be any records with the medical services, school or police. The mother says the school did nothing, which suggests she told them, but no record has been produced. Stab threat. Jamal is alleged to have threatened to stab Bailey. Tommy initially states that the threat is made to Bailey directly in class, but later amends this to having been heard secondhand in the dining hall from an Asian friend of Jamal, which is in line with Bailey's testimony. The Asian friend is never identified beyond the name Ahmed, and Bailey claims that he had pieced together his recollection of this after making his statement, which is implausible. The court considers that Bailey manufactured his testimony in gratitude to Tommy, who had been very supportive to him. Bailey's repetition in the video of the phrase what are you saying now suggests provocation on Jamal's part, but the only evidence that the provocation was a stab threat is the second-hand report of Ahmed, and we do know that Jamal provoked Bailey by swearing at him. 
Tommy's truth defence did not succeed, and it couldn't. Even if the judge had really liked him, which obviously he didn't, it wouldn't succeed because it was too implausible or too weak, or too implausible and too weak. And Tommy knows this better than any of us. He knows it better than you, he knows it better than me, because he was there hearing the whole thing in real time, not just reading a written judgment. He's dishonestly claiming that he won this on the basis of the facts, and Tommy knows that he can do this because he's well aware that a lot of his supporters aren't exactly the sharpest knives in the drawer and they will believe anything he says. This is obviously dishonest and unethical. Tommy, stop lying about this. A slightly amusing detour. All this did result in me making the first video and then the second video as a radical correction to the first video. And as a consequence of that, that ended up with somebody making a meme of me. My first ever meme. Oh, happy day. One of Tommy's Urban Scoop crew was so pissed off that they posted that on Twitter, which looks like me surrounded by a cross between Agent Smith from the Matrix films and Ron DeSantis. It looks that way to me anyway. So proud, my first meme. It's worth saying that all of that only relates to those key aspects of Tommy's libel defence. I disagree with two other aspects of the judge's findings, the board pin incident and the broken arm incident. I might make a video about that and make this into a little franchise. We should consider several other things. There were rape threats aplenty from the local Muslim community in the aftermath of all this. We know this because I kept the screenshots, some of which you are looking at here. We also know that if this had been a Muslim boy on a white boy rather than a white boy on a Muslim boy, the press would have been completely silent. We know this because there are exactly those videos out there and the press do not have a word to say about them because they do not align with the approved narrative, which is ethnic good and native bad. We know the press lied. Racist bullying probe, a schoolboy refugee pushed to ground and waterboarded. Police investigate racial attack on boy at Huddersfield School. This was a lie. His most noble Justice Nicklin says no racial abuse is directed at Jamal during the incident. Did the Mirror or the Guardian retract their lies? What a silly question. We know that Bailey and his family had to be relocated and rehoused because of threats from the local Islamic Gestapo, and Kirkley's council, led apparently by the brother of a local activist imam, sought to rehouse them in the middle of a heavily Islamic area next to a brothel and surrounded by mosques. We have a testimony to the effect that NDAs were issued by Kirkley's council and money is pretty compellingly alleged to have changed hands in order to secure staff silence. My view is yeah. that you won't get much of an answer out of Rob because he worked there and he's bound by various confidentialities. So. Non-disclosure agreements. Do you get paid as well? Not going to happen. I can't see the figure because if I see the figure, okay. it goes out. It's made. 18. 18. It is fair to say that many of Tommy's videos do contain false or misleading claims, so it's hard to be sure. This is the problem with lying. When you get a reputation for it, if you then make something which is entirely honest, people are going to say, well, this person does have a reputation of making false and misleading claims. Should I take them seriously here? The solution to that is not to lie to begin with. However, the people in the video you just saw do seem to be professional, serious-minded people, and they are speaking without knowing they're being recorded, so they're probably speaking entirely candidly. So it's more likely than not that Kirkley's council did issue NDAs, and that money did change hands. And finally, we should remember that this is, of course, Huddersfield, ground zero for the Pakistani rape gangs. If anyone tries to tell you, and they will, that this is not an Islamic Pakistani problem, then I would encourage you to invite them to do a Google image search of Huddersfield grooming gangs and then invite them to explain what they see looking back at them. All this video focuses on is why Tommy did not succeed in his defence of the libel charge from Jamal, 
and why this is not because anyone is being coerced or silenced by the local marauding Mazzywazzies, but simply because the evidence was not there.